This is the Formula E iceberg chart. If you're not familiar with iceberg charts, let me give you a quick rundown. Iceberg charts are a way to organize information uh, about a certain topic or subject in a descending order. At the top are the things that most people would know, some of the most obvious things that aren't really all too interesting. And as we go down, the things get more and more obscure, more and more interesting, and you may not know the things at the bottom of the list. So I've worked for the last few months on making a Formula E version with a lot of little tidbits and facts that I have accumulated together. Uh, before we begin here, I want to give a quick shout out to the Formula E subreddit. I asked a question on the subreddit and asked for potential entries to this iceberg list, and they definitely delivered. And uh, a lot of the items on this list I'm able to flesh out a little bit more. Uh, some items are, came from that altogether. And uh, as you can see the names on screen right now, I would like to give credit to for helping me with some of these ideas. And one last thing before we get started here, I am a little bit sick, I do apologize for that. Uh, you can probably hear it in my voice, but um, yeah, let's get right into it. Fan Boost Right from Formula E's first race till just recently, Fan Boost was a staple in other motorsports fans' criticism of Formula E. In essence, Fan Boost was an idea to get fans involved in the race, voting on which three drivers in the field got a temporary 100 kilowatt energy boost they could use once in the race. There were many reasons this was a bad idea, not the least of which was that this turned competition in Formula E into basically a popularity contest. Thankfully, it was removed before the start of the 2023 season. Just failed F1 drivers. Another popular criticism of Formula E is that most of the field is just drivers who either failed to reach F1 or weren't successful enough to do well in F1. And if you have a look at the field, it isn't hard to see where they're coming from. However, I don't necessarily think this is a bad thing. Formula 1 is the very highest level of racing, and if you train drivers to reach it and they ultimately don't, you still have a field of very talented, very competitive drivers. If you look at someone like Nick DeVries, he had the talent to race in F1, but was forced out due to not finding a seat. I think his success in Formula E was part of the reason he was being still looked at for an F1 seat almost three years after his F2 title. Car Swaps For the first four years of Formula E, the series used a Gen 1 car designed by Spark. The car had a max power output of 190 kilowatts and was able to regenerate about 100 kilowatts of power. Although impressive for its time, this meant that the car did not have enough power to last the entire race. Halfway through each race, the drivers had to pull in and make a pit stop, frantically exit their car, and scramble and belt into another one. This was a really iconic element of early Formula E, but with the advent of the Gen 2 car, the car was able to regenerate enough energy in the race to not need a car swap. Attack Mode With the removal of pit stops for the Gen 2, Formula E introduced Attack Mode. This concept would allow drivers to take a specific line on a racetrack to enable a temporary power boost. The amount of time it lasted, as well as the frequency of how many times the drivers were required to use it each race, varied. Personally, this is one of my favorite aspects of Formula E, and I hope it isn't fully replaced by attack charts next season. 2014 Beijing Finish The 2014 Beijing E-Prix was the highly anticipated first race of the FIA Formula E World Championship. No one knew whether the race would actually be exciting, or if the cars would even get off the grid. For the most part, the race went smoothly. In the closing laps, Nick Heidfeld and his Venturi was chasing down Nico Prost in his Renault. Heading into the final corner, the two came together, sending Heidfeld out of control and into the air, flipping three times before coming to a rest upside down. Lucas Di Grassi was able to pass both drivers and claim the victory. This was a huge moment for Formula E as it created headlines in their very first race. Season 2 Finale Heading into the final race in London in Season 2, Lucas Degrassi and his Audi led Sebastian Buemi's Renault by just 3 points in the Drivers' Championship. After Buemi won the pole, however, both drivers were exactly tied at 153 points heading into the E-Prix. With Degrassi qualifying P3, he would start directly behind his title rival on the grid. After getting a better start off the line, the Audi driver was right on the rear wing of Buemi heading into turn 1 when the Renault break earlier than Degrassi was expecting, causing him to slam into the back of Buemi, damaging both cars and taking them out of contention for the race win. However, both drivers still had the chance to earn 2 points for the fastest lap. After hopping into their second cars, both drivers fought hard to claim the fastest lap, which Buemi was able to eventually get, earning him the Season 2 Championship. Monaco for all but three seasons in Formula E, the series has gone to the famous Circuit de Monaco. For seasons 1, 2, and 5, the series used an interesting layout, cutting out most of the first sector of the recognizable F1 circuit. For season 7, however, Monaco returned to Formula E with the full layout. 
In the Season 7 Monaco E period was viewed as one of the best Formula E races of all time. Though F1's Monaco races are fairly monotonous, Formula E is consistently able to put on a good show with their smaller cars. 9 Days in Berlin When the 2020 pandemic shut down most sporting events, Formula E had completed 5 races of the scheduled 14 race season 6. After a 6 month hiatus, Formula E returned to the Berlin Tempelhof Airport to close out their season with 6 races. Utilizing three different track configurations and having to complete all races in nine days, it was a huge logistical challenge and one that eventually succeeded. In these six races, we saw some amazing moments, with one of the closest finishes in Formula E history, with Mercedes winning their first race with a 1-2, and with Antonio Felix Costa winning the championship. If you're interested to learn more, there's a documentary on the FE YouTube channel titled Nine Days in Berlin, which is really well made, and I'd recommend giving it a watch. 2021 Valencia in a wet and dry race of attrition which saw 7 cars DNF before the last few laps and 5 safety car periods, a severe time miscalculation meant that after the last safety car period ended, the drivers would need to complete 2 laps instead of the expected 1. This resulted in an embarrassing last lap, in which only 9 cars were recorded as finishing the race, while cars around the track rolled around without power, and others were disqualified for using too much power to finish the race. In the end, Mercedes EQ scored a double podium, with Nick DeVries and Stoffel Van Dorn calculating the race perfectly. Dragon Penske's Nico Muller scored an astounding P2. Since this race, things like safety car procedures have been altered in hopes of preventing a farce like this from happening again. Berlin 2023 Protests You've probably seen this already, as it only happened a little while ago, and that's why it's so high up on the list. Before the second of this year's Berlin e -Pris, just as the cars were smoking up their tires and locking into the grid, we saw some climate change protesters hop the fence and proceed to sit down in front of the cars on the track and try to glue themselves. Later, the German climate change group Let Let's say let, Oh my god. Let's the Let's the Generation claimed responsibility for the protest. You know, Formula E isn't a hundred percent environmentally friendly. But I think they should have picked a different motorsports than the one that's literally going out of its way to promote sustainability and climate change. Anyways, they were quickly taken by security, and the race was continued without any more issues. Season 8 NYC Incident Late in the Season 8 New York City e -Prix, rain began to fall on a specific corner of the track catching drivers and FE officials off guard. When the leaders reached this part of the track, the depth of the standing water exceeded the little tread left on their tires, causing them to lose control and hydroplane straight into the barriers. All in all, about 8 cars were collected, including race leader Nick Cassidy. Afterwards, the race was called, with the results going back to before the incident happened, giving Cassidy his first career win. Although this technically wasn't Formula E or the driver's fault, it became a bit of a meme last year, and I gotta admit, it was a pretty funny visual. Celebrity Formula E Drivers In its marketing, Formula E has allowed several celebrities to get behind the wheel in one of their cars. Notable names include former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, actors Aidan Gallagher, Idris Elba, Patrick Dempsey, Orlando Bloom, and Chris Hemsworth, actresses Emily... Oh my gosh... Ratajkowski Ratajkowski and Liv Taylor, and many more names. Apparently, they really just let anyone drive one, especially after Chris Hemsworth wrecked out in one. Formula E Viral Videos This entry refers to some of the more interesting videos Formula E has produced for their YouTube channel. The most popular video on the ABB Formula E YouTube channel is one in which the Gen 3 Formula E car is raced up against a cheetah. Another one of the most popular videos is of stuntman Damian Walters doing a backflip over a moving Formula E car. These are pretty fun to watch, and I guess serve their purpose of dragging more eyes to Formula E. Formula E Race at Home Challenge The Formula E Race at Home Challenge was an esports competition that began after the COVID-19 pandemic cancelled Formula E events. On R Factor 2, the real teams and drivers of Formula E could compete for a trophy, and the races would be streamed on the Formula E social channels. The competition was split between the real Formula E drivers and the Challenge Grid drivers made up of gamers and influencers. The series partnered with UNICEF to help donate towards those affected by the COVID pandemic, specifically children. Stoffel Van Dorn won the championship while esports driver Kevin Siggy won the Challenge Grid title. This series was the site of some controversy we'll discuss a little further down the list, but we'll get to that later. Unplugged 
Formula E Unplugged was essentially FE's version of Drive to Survive. It's a docuseries that goes in depth into the world of Formula E. I haven't watched season 2 yet, which focuses on last season of Formula E, but all of season 1, which focuses on the 2020-2021 season of Formula E or season 7, is available on the Formula E YouTube channel. I highly recommend giving it a watch as it's produced and directed very well. Marbula E during the 2020 COVID pandemic, Envision Virgin Racing collaborated with the YouTube channel Gel's Marble Run to create a Formula E inspired Marble Run series. The individual marbles represented Formula E teams, and the commentary was done by the one and only Jack Nichols. Each of the tracks the marbles raced on were representations of the real Formula E tracks, and Porsche won the championship. It was a lot of fun, and I'd check it out if you're curious about it. Season 7 Finale Heading into the final race of Season 7 at Berlin, an astounding 14 drivers were still mathematically eligible to win the championship. However, there were four main championship protagonists. Nick DeVries led Eduardo Mortara by 3 points, Jake Dennis was 4 back, and Mitch Evans was 5 back. Mitch Evans qualified highest of the title contenders in 3rd, but after his Jaguar suffered an inverter failure, he was left stranded as the 5 lights went out. All cars were able to just avoid him with the exception of championship rival Eduardo Mortara, who slammed into the back of Evans at a whopping 26 Gs, causing him to suffer a slight fracture to his vertebrae. Heading back to green after a safety car period, Jake Dennis and Nick DeVries were tied for the championship lead when Jake Dennis locked up his BMW heading into turn 1 and slammed into the wall, breaking the rear axle of his car and knocking him out of the contention. From there, Nick DeVries would cruise easily to his first Formula E championship. Ice Drive. In 2016, Formula E worked with Aurora Media to shoot a documentary. The subject of this documentary would be on transporting a Formula E race car to Greenland and driving atop a literal ice cap. Lucas Degrassi was chosen as the driver for the expedition, and it was all done to raise awareness about climate change. I gotta say, in terms of marketing, this was definitely an impressive way to make a statement. Again, the documentary is wonderfully made and is available on the Formula E YouTube channel, worth the watch. Buemi 2017 Montreal Meltdown The closing weekend of the 2016-17 Formula E season took the series to Montreal, with Sebastian Buemi locked in the title fight. After qualifying P2, Buemi was given a grid penalty for changing a battery starting him mid-pack. Into turn 2, Buemi was clipped by Robin Frines in the Andretti, breaking the Renault steering. Despite this, Buemi was able to charge back to an impressive P4. After the race, however, he would confront Andretti driver Antonio Felix da Costa for a little bit, believing he had been the one to break Buemi's steering. Da Costa was understandably confused, and it took a little bit for Buemi to realize it had actually been his teammate Robin Freins. The two then argued over Freins' move, with the Dutchman claiming he had avoided a larger accident. Buemi then stormed off to challenge Daniel Lapt, another driver he had made contact with in the race. This entire incident seemed like a bit of an overreaction to fans at the time, and one of the reasons Buemi was quite disliked by fans at the time. Lucas Degrassi London 2021 During the second London e Prix of Season 7, a safety car was called on lap 12 following an incident between Antonio Felix da Costa and Andre Lauderer. As the field rounded the pit straight, 8th place runner Lucas Degrassi dove into the pit lane seemingly having a problem. Degrassi would stop briefly in its pit box and quickly get back going, miraculously rejoining the track in the race lead. An unseen flaw in the design of the London circuit resulted in the pit lane being a shorter way around the track than the main straight and while under safety car, a driver could use this to their advantage. Degrassi would resume the race in the lead, but was later given a penalty for not coming to a complete stop in the pits. He was later disqualified after not serving the penalty, claiming Audi did not inform him of it. Still, if Degrassi had come to a complete stop, likely still would have rejoined in the lead, and surely would have won the race. After this race, the rules were changed, forcing the pitting car to stop for 10 seconds and not allowing entry into the pit lane after a safety car passed a certain point. This race also gave us the famous Alan McNish. And to Evo. Midway through its fifth season, Formula E announced that the newly debuted Gen 2 car would be updated before its third season. Similarly to how the Gen 1 was updated before Gen 2, the updated car would be titled the Gen 2 Evo, and would primarily revise some of the bodywork of the Gen 2. In an attempt to reduce on-track contact and rough racing, the car was designed to be a bit more fragile, eliminating the front wheel covers and weakening the back end of the car. In addition, the front wing was made slightly more aerodynamic and a shark fin was added behind the roll hoop. Teams even unveiled concept liveries on this car, set to debut in Season 7. 
Then, of course, the pandemic happened during Season 6, resulting in the Gen 2 EVO being delayed and eventually cancelled altogether, with Formula E choosing to run the same Gen 2 for all four years of its tenure. However, some features of the Gen 2 EVO were carried over to the Gen 3 car. In my opinion, this was one of the biggest casualties of the COVID-19 pandemic as the Gen 2 EVO looked absolutely beautiful. I'm here with Dario Franchitti. The Formula E commentary booth has seen a few changes over the years, but for most of the series history, the two lead commentators were Jack Nichols and Dario Franchitti. In the broadcast introduction before each race in Season 8, Jack Nichols took it to introduce Dario in a different way each time. Let me give you some examples. My name is Jack Nichols. Alongside me in commentary is the man who finished second in the 1999 car season, Dario Franchitti. Dario, a great track here in Mexico. My name is Jack Nichols. Alongside me here in the commentary box in Monaco is the 1993 Formula Vauxhall Lotus champion, Dario Franchitti. My name is Jack Nichols. Alongside me is the man who finished third in the 1998 kart championship, Dario Franchitti. Jack. Uh, my name is Jack Nichols. Uh, alongside me is the man who finished 33rd in the 2008 Daytona 500, Dario Franchitti. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, Jack. Nick DeVries Maserati. After the Mercedes EQ team pulled out of Formula E last season, Season 7 champion Nick DeVries was left looking for a ride. Eventually, he signed a contract with the newly rebranded Maserati MSG Racing for the 2023 season alongside Eduardo Mortara. Things, however, escalated after he subbed in for Alexander Albon at Monza in Formula 1 and finished P9, putting his name on the radar for 2023. It wasn't long before he signed with the AlphaTauri Formula 1 team, activating the clause intentionally included in his contract with Maserati. The Maserati team was then left to go with their plan B and eventual driver for 2023, Maximilian Gunter. It's interesting to think about, though, with Maserati's struggles this season, if DeVries hadn't been signed to AlphaTauri and had stayed in Formula E another season, he may not have even been looked at for a Formula 1 seat in 2024, losing his eventual chance. Jaguar I-Pace E Trophy The Jaguar I-Pace E Trophy was a short-lived Formula E feeder series utilizing a race-ready version of the electric Jaguar I-Pace. The series began in 2018 alongside Formula E Season 5, offering supporting events to the e -Pres. In 2019, the series was brought back for a Season 2, but COVID-19 pandemic forced the eventual cancellation of the series. Now, I'm definitely planning on making a video covering this series in further detail in the future, so stay tuned for that. Nico Rosberg The only driver to beat Lewis Hamilton at the top of his game in Eagle Machinery, the one and only Nico Rosberg, was actually the first driver to ever publicly drive the Formula E Gen 2 car. In May of 2018, Rosberg tested the Gen 2 car for the first time at the Berlin Teppelhof circuit, and even after the test, Rosberg has been an active supporter of Formula E, believing the series can be a key promoter of the fight against climate change. Max Verstappen Punishment After getting together with Esteban Ocon after the 2018 Brazilian Grand Prix, two-time Formula 1 champion Max Verstappen was sent to the 2019 Marrakesh E Prix as a punishment from the FIA, serving as an observer to the stewards. Although Verstappen claimed to really enjoy the race, it was seen as unacceptable from some Formula E drivers like Sam Bird to compare watching Formula E to basically community service from the FIA no less. Personally, I think it's hilarious, but definitely a bit unprofessional on their part. Pierre Gasly On the weekend of the 2019 New York City doubleheader, the World Endurance Championship took to Germany for the six hours of Nürburgring. Championship leader Sebastian Buemi opted to vacate his Reynolds seat for the weekend, prioritizing his drive with Toyota in the LMP1 class. Reynolds Edams decided to put Red Bull Jr. Pierre Gasly into the car for the doubleheader. Despite never having driven a Formula E car, Gasly did very well, qualifying P19 and finishing P7 in his debut race, and the next day qualifying and finishing P4 after challenging from a podium, but sustaining damage on the last lap. Really impressive one-off outing. Van Boost. This entry refers to the fact that from the race that XF1 driver Stoffel Van Dorn joined Formula E, he has never once failed to win Van Boost. Every single race. That's 55 times he's been voted to win. I think this was part of the reason Van Boost was dropped, as the rule was changed conveniently the season after Stoffel Van Dorn won the championship. The Napkin. On March 3, 2011, in a small Italian restaurant in the heart of Paris, Formula E was born. A meeting between Formula E CEO Alejandro Agag, FIA President Jean Todd, and European Commissioner for Industry and Entrepreneurship Antonio Tajani 
resulted in the ideas of an electric street racing series being presented. These ideas were initially jotted down on a napkin, which is now recognized as essentially the birth certificate of Formula E. Robo Race Robo Race was an electric autonomous racing series conceptualized to potentially become a support series of Formula E. It would essentially involve teams developing AI software to allow their cars to independently race and pass each other. Lucas Degrassi became CEO and an investor in the series, and the cars debuted during the 2016-2017 Formula E season, not looking too impressive and somehow crashing several times in the process. Later though, they were able to make runs at the Goodwood Festival of Speed, becoming the fastest autonomous racing car to make a time there. If you're interested in learning a bit more about the series, check out this video by FP1Will, I'll leave a link in the comments. But you've probably seen this clip of Robo Race testing one of their cars before. So Robo Race is hoping to have not just providing us with an entertaining sports watch, but also providing us with the real world benefits. Oh no, and the start has not gone to plan for Team Acronis SIT because the car has been. Formulaic. The Formulaic EF1 was the first all electric racing car developed by South African company Formulaic. The car was first presented at the Paris Motor Show in 2010 and tested later that year by drivers such as Jules Bianchi and Lucas Degrassi. The car had 300 horsepower and a top speed of 160 miles per hour. Originally, they were set to race with their own championship in 2012, but that didn't pan out. And when Formula E was created in 2014, there were talks that Formula E could develop a new car to race in their own championship, but that didn't pan out either. In essence, this set the groundwork for Formula E, proving that electric race cars were indeed possible. Lucas Degrassi was the first driver. Lucas Degrassi is one of the most successful drivers in Formula E history. The Season 3 champion and a 13-time winner, Degrassi has competed in Formula E since its inaugural season in 2014, but Degrassi's affiliation with Formula E went back even further. In 2012, Alejandro Agag, one of Formula E's founders, sought out Degrassi to help with the development of the car. Degrassi tested the aforementioned Formula E and eventually became the official test driver of Formula E, contributing to the development of the Gen 1. He later terminated his contract to take part in the series, winning its very first race in Beijing. Formula EJ Formula EJ was the official DJ for Formula E and I believe was responsible for a lot of the music we heard early in Formula E during replays, safety cars, etc. and who also played in front of live crowds at Formula E races looking to pump things up a bit. Side note, did you know that the official Formula E theme had lyrics to it? I only found that out while writing this entry to the list. Anyways, Formula EJ is also an active artist, but I'm not sure how popular his music is. The general consensus I could find among Formula E fans is that he was a bit annoying, and the music in the early seasons took away from the professionalism of the racing. Slowly though, the presence of music during the races died down, and nowadays it's only really played in replays, the start procedure, and other non-racing moments. I'm not sure if Formula E is even associated with EJ anymore. Vern spins to pole. This entry refers to pole qualifying at the 2017 Hong Kong E Prix. John Young Vern driving for Dechita was on a flying lap looking to take pole. Coming out of the sweeping left-hander across the line, Vern lost control and spun, crossing the line with a 1 minute 3.568, taking P1 by just 3 hundredths of a second over Sam Bird. Bob Varsha Bob Varsha was one of Formula E's commentators for Season 3 and 4 of Formula E. A legendary American commentator for F1 and IndyCar, he spent the first season with Fox Sports before moving into the worldwide broadcast booth with Jack Nichols and Dario Franchitti. During this time, though, he rarely interjected on the broadcast, kind of coming out of nowhere at some points, and remaining silent for most of the race. Usually, it was his job to announce the fan vote winners midway through the race. Second two weeks ago in Rome, did Andre Losser in that black and gold to see Jakar and off it's Roland! Oliver Rowland in the wall, all by himself by the looks of things, from the lead of the race for Nissan. Maxi Gunter's lurking in behind the two. Neos are going to hit each other. That's the last thing. Have you ever driven in a hail storm in a single seater? Uh, snow. Snow? Yeah, it snowed once. Okay. In fifth place, Turvey was in attack mode, slamming into the wall is Dillman. Can he keep going? He's got now to Costa up the inside of Bird and the two bang wheels. Yeah. 
<laughs> much, much happier in the commentary booth. I will <laughs> see that. But look at these fans. They are not leaving their seats nope. despite the weather. The Valencia Chicane. Ahead of the 2017-18 Formula E season, the official preseason testing circuit for the series switched from Donington Park to Valencia. Despite using the national configuration, Formula E added an entire chicane to the main straight to reduce speeds into turn 1 and prevent the cars from hitting the rev limiter. Some of the drivers were concerned about this positioning and the lack of any curbs. These fears were elevated after Sam Bird brought up the red flag after a crash into the chicane. An additional chicane was added at the beginning of the straight in response to this, however this wasn't the last time this was changed. The next year, despite featuring faster Gen 2 cars, the second chicane was removed and again saw many accidents. The chicane's purpose was important though, as Valencia is a permanent racing circuit, it served as one of the few corners drivers could use to emulate the tighter corners of street circuits. Before the 2021 season, the chicane was moved again, this time just before the start-finish line where it was for the two E-Prix that took place later that year. It remains there to this day. Vostalpine European Trophy During the 2018-19 Formula E season, a side competition was created for the European races in the calendar and was sponsored by Austrian steel company Vostalpine. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, man. In essence, the driver who achieved the most podium finishes in all the European races would win a trophy. In the end, eventual season champion Jean-Eric Verne took the trophy, scoring three podiums in the five European races, including two victories in Monaco and Bern. Gen 1 was a rejected IndyCar. car. The design of the Gen 1 Formula E car was created through the combined efforts of Spark Racing Technology and Italian racing manufacturer Dallara. Now, Dallara worked with many racing series at the time, including designing the cars and aero kits for the IndyCar series. In 2012, the IndyCar series adopted the IR12 chassis car, with several design modifications specifically for the series. Now, RaceCarEngineering.com released an article several years ago showcasing several rejected designs for the IR12 IndyCar. Among them was this concept right here. Now, let me show you this side by side with our Gen 1 FE car, and tell me, do you think Delara copied their own homework? Dan Tictum's Ferrari. This entry refers to two separate incidents involving Dan Tictum and his beloved Ferrari F12 Berlinetta. The first one occurred during the 2022 Monaco e Prix weekend. Apparently, Tictum had parked his Ferrari illegally in Raskas, and according to journalist Hazel Southwell, Tictum had to rush in and argue to prevent it from being towed away. The second incident occurred just under a month later. In Staffordshire, England, police caught Tictum's Ferrari traveling at 114 miles per hour. We don't know if it was Tictum driving, as he failed to tell police that, we do know he was fined over 700 pounds in total and gained 6 penalty points on his driver's license. Formula E School Series Formula E's first ever support series began in 2015 as the Formula E School Series. The series wouldn't be so much to develop drivers for Formula E, rather to encourage young interest in sustainable motorsport engineering. Students from 10 local schools would compete to build their own electric race car and compete on the tracks during the Formula E weekends. Five weekends were selected during Formula E's first season, and apparently the battles for the win were pretty entertaining. However, the series was not brought back for the second season of Formula E. Still, I'd say this was an interesting way to get potential future engineers invested into Formula E. Nissan Dual Motor Powertrain Ahead of Season 5, the first Gen 2 season, the newly renamed Nissan Edams developed a powertrain called the Nissan IM01, which was the only powertrain on the entire grid to feature a dual motor setup. Though technically not having more power, the motors may have had an influence on the blistering pace Nissan had in qualifying during that season, with Sebastian Buemi and Oliver Rowland scoring 6 poles and making it to Super Pole 18 times. Despite this, and Sebastian Buemi scoring P2 in the driver's standings, the team as a whole only finished 4th in the constructor standings. However, just before the final weekend in New York, it was announced that the dual motor powertrains would be banned following the conclusion of Season 5, citing costs as a deciding factor, and specifically not to limit technological development. Scott Speed Debut Scott Speed is an American driver who has raced in countless racing championships, including Formula 1, NASCAR, IndyCar, and Rallycross. In 2014, Speed set his sights on joining Formula E, and tested for Andretti during preseason testing for Season 1, ultimately missing out on a drive. The next season, however, Speed was able to make his debut, filling in for Marco Andretti at the Miami E-Prix. Speed would set good pace in FP1 and qualified 11th on the grid. However, in the race, he would charge his way up the order, performing some amazing overtakes to eventually finish P2, right on the rear wing of eventual race winner Nico Prost. 
It was an amazing debut performance, but despite making three more starts in Formula E, Speed was never able to replicate the amazing result. Notable Formula E Testers This entry refers to the fact that many notable names in racing have gone behind the wheel of a Formula E car for one of the group tests. These names include Colton Herta, Patrick Carpentier, Pippa Mann, Jamie Chadwick, Arthur Leclerc, Sergei Sorotkin, and Kyle Kirkwood. Some of these were brought into light with the recent rookie test in Berlin. Hong Kong Reason for Removal The Hong Kong Harbour Front Circuit had been a staple of Formula E since its inaugural race in Season 3. However, just before the beginning of Season 6, the future looked uncertain. New regulations set by the FIA required the circuit to be at least 1.4 miles or 2.2 kilometers long, requiring the circuit to be extended by about 0.3 miles or 0.4 kilometers. This would be difficult as the circuit was tightly bound by the Hong Kong metro station to the west, and an eastern extension proved too dangerous for high-speed cars. In the end, the circuit was left off the schedule due to additional issues in the area, namely civil unrest and protests. For months, the city had been the site of violent pro-democracy protests, cancelling local events, and eventually convinced the race organizers that a renewal of the event was off the cards. Alexander Albon for the 2018-19 Formula E season, Nissan eDams signed Dams F2 driver Alexander Albon to their team, to replace Nico Prost and partner Sebastian Vuelli for Season 5. However, on the first day of preseason testing for the season at Valencia, Albon was unable to participate due to meeting with Red Bull representatives about a potential F1 drive. Oliver Rowland had been on standby for Albon, but was only able to start driving the car on day 3 of the test. Albon, meanwhile, signed with the Toro Rosso F1 team ahead of the 2019 Formula 1 season, leaving Nissan to settle on Roland to fill the second seat. Because the signing was so sudden, the only time we know Albon actually drove the FE car was in a secret test in Caliphate. Ghost Racing Video Game In 2019, Formula E announced they had partnered with Virtually Entertained to create a mobile game titled Ghost Racing. It would revolutionize game sport interaction by featuring real-life telemetry, transferring the movements of the real cars into the game, and allowing the players to race against the drivers in real time. In addition, the game would allow players to recreate moments from Formula E, alongside player v player racing and time attack. And even if one didn't want to race against the real drivers, the app would allow them to follow along with the real drivers during the race using the simulation. Honestly, it really seemed too good to be true. Unfortunately, by the looks of it, it seems to have been killed off after the COVID pandemic, and I don't believe it's available on any platform anymore. Still though, a really interesting concept that I'd love to see return someday. Berlin Refugees The Berlin Tempelhof Airport Circuit is one of the most iconic tracks in Formula E, and it's one of the few that remains from the Season 1 schedule. However, for Season 2, the track was unable to be used for a very specific reason. The area was being used by the German government as a refugee camp for those fleeing countries such as Syria during conflict. Due to this, other circuits in the Berlin area were considered, including the Norris Ring and a street circuit in Munich. Eventually, an agreement was made to run the race in downtown Berlin, granting an exemption from the Senate of Berlin as motor racing was not permitted on public roads. Construction began 12 days before the race, and the race was done without any real issues. Nick Heidfeld Streak when Nick Heidfeld left Formula 1 after 12 seasons of racing, he held the record for most points without a win and most podiums without a win. While the former has been broken, Heidfeld still holds the record for most podiums without a win at 13. What you may not know is that when Nick Heidfeld joined Formula E in its inaugural season and left at the end of season 4, he continued his streak. Currently, Heidfeld is tied for the most podiums without a win with Andre Lauder at 8, and sits second behind Lauder for most points without a win, having held the lead in that stat until season 6. Interesting little fact to think about. No Deal Island e Prix. After the 2022 Seoul e Prix, plans for the event's return this year were cancelled due to renovations in the Jamsil Stadium. Race organizers began to look for alternate locations for the race to take place, and one of them was on the No Deal Island on the Han River. In my opinion, this is one of the most unique proposals for an e Prix, as the island is less than half a mile or 0.8 kilometers across, and there isn't a lot of empty space for a track or grandstands. I'm really interested to see what they would have done here, but ultimately, the event was scrapped in favor of Cape Town. Scuderia E Early in 2020, a new team looked to break its way out of the Formula E grid, Scuderia E. The effort was headed by co-founder Fisker Automotive, an Italian by the name of Gianfranco Pizzuto. The team would also partner with Turkish battery company Imacar Electronic. Pizzuto also alluded to a potential partnership with Fiat, claiming to have connections with the company. Due to the grid being full at 12 teams, Scuderia E looked to either partner with or buy out one of the existing teams. 
by May of 2020, they claimed to have been talking to three teams on the grid and were putting together funding to ensure their longevity in the sport. However, as we all know, nothing ever came out of this. It's possible the team were too affected by the COVID-19 pandemic to join, or perhaps they simply couldn't find funding. Either way, they seem to have been one of the most prepared teams to not join the Formula E grid. Jake Dennis was an odd signing. When BMW Andretti signed Jake Dennis to their team replacing Alex Sims before Season 7, it raised quite a few eyebrows. At the time, Dennis was an Aston Martin driver in the Intercontinental GT Championship, as well as a Red Bull F1 development driver. He had also raced an Aston Martin for R Motorsport in DTM, so it was surprising when BMW passed up several drivers on their own DTM program for a driver in a rival organization. One of the top drivers in the running of the seat was Philip Eng, who eventually became the team's reserve driver for that season. Andretti's Revolving Door of Drivers Andretti is a team that's been in Formula E since the very beginning. During its tenure, however, it's had the most drivers out of any Formula E team period. In Season 1 alone, they ran 8 different drivers for their team. In recent years, this number has stabilized, but they're still responsible for running 17 different drivers over the course of their Formula E history, and may even run 18 by the end of this year if Andre Lauder chooses to sit out. BMW Car Naming this entry refers to the fact that when BMW joined Formula E in Season 5, or the 2018-19 season, their car was titled the BMW IFE.18. The next season, however, the 2019-20 season, their car was titled the BMW IFE.20. They had somehow skipped an entire number, possibly getting confused by the fact that Formula E starts their seasons in one year and ends in another. For the 2020-21 season, their car was titled the BMW IFE21, now fully converted to the year the season ends. Drayson Racing Drayson Racing was the first ever team to agree to race in Formula E in January of 2013. The UK-based operation worked with Formula E to test and develop the cars to be run in the very first season and planned to run their own powertrain, the one developed for their Lola Drayson V1269EV. They even offered up a competition to students at London's Royal College of Art to design concepts for the new race car. Despite the commitment, however, Drayson Racing withdrew their team from competing in Formula E, instead choosing to partner with Yarno Trulli and his Trulli GP team. Drayson stayed working with Formula E, apparently trying to get a universal wireless charging for the grid. Not sure how well that played out, but Drayson remains an important part of Formula E's history. Degrassi Punta del Este Penalty Lucas Degrassi finished the 2018 Punta del Este E Prix in P2, but that didn't stop him from being scrutinized by the stewards. After the race, Degrassi was fined £10,000 and was given three penalty points on his racing license for wearing non-compliant, fireproof underwear. Don't even ask me how they found that out. Degrassi apologized and explained that, quote, It was a decision that I took today because of the extreme heat and I ran out of underwear and I didn't want to use a wet one, so I put a new one on. Make of this what you will. Berlin Shortcut Lucas Degrassi's pit lane shortcut in London in 2021 wasn't the first time this particular tactic was used in Formula E. During the first race back from the COVID-19 hiatus in Berlin, a full course yellow was called for Felipe Massa. All cars slowed to safety car speed, which was the same as pit speed at the time, and since the pit lane around Berlin is shorter than taking the outside track, drivers used this to gain time. Sebastian Buemi and his Nissan pulled down, stopped, and pulled back out of the pits, gaining a bit on the car ahead. The Mahindra of Jerome D'Ambrosio did the same, pulling in, stopping and pulling out, and he actually gained a position. Better yet, the other Mahindra of Alex Lynn pulled down, stopped, and pulled back out, and gained three positions. None of these drivers were penalized, as unlike Degrassi, they had come to complete stops. But the pit speed was changed to prevent the shortcut being used again during the Berlin races. Leonardo DiCaprio In the early days of Formula E, Actor Leonardo DiCaprio became a co-founder of the Venturi Formula E team, being a huge proponent for climate change and sustainability. At the time of the Venturi team's buyout by Scott Swid and Jose Maria as Narbatella in 2020, team principal Susie Wolf claimed, We have no connection with him whatsoever about DiCaprio. Still, he was seen attending multiple Formula E races, often in the paddock area. The year before, in 2019, DiCaprio served as a co-producer for a Formula E-centered documentary titled and We Go Green, covering the 2017-18 Formula E season and Formula E's goals as a series. It premiered at the 2019 Toronto International Film Festival and received an 80% on Rotten Tomatoes. Renault Stick Shift 
Season 2 of Formula E saw a lot more engineering freedom opened up for the teams in the grid. Teams can now develop their own powertrains, and many fiddled around with the transmission and motor setups to gain an advantage. DS and Virgin developed a twin motor powertrain with a singular gear. Andretti used a 5 gear single motor layout used in Season 1, while Venturi, Dragon, and Mahindra used a 4 gear layout. Audi developed a 3 gear layout in conjunction with other changes, but the most interesting development was probably made by Renault Edams. They would develop a large singular motor on a 2 gear transmission system. In addition, they would look to save weight by including a stick shifter next to the steering wheel in the cockpit with a cable running to the gearbox. This was definitely unique for the time, and may have contributed to Reynolds' success that season, taking both the driver's and constructor's titles. Vancouver E Prix The Vancouver E Prix was scheduled to be Formula E's return to Canada after a five year hiatus. The race, which would take place on the old IndyCar circuit, was scheduled for the July 2nd weekend of 2022, being the climax of a three-day Canadian e-festival promoting sustainability. By March of 2022, almost 30,000 tickets had already been sold. However, by this time, the City of Vancouver's Special Events Department had not even issued permits for the event, and plans for traffic management and safety had not been finalized. Ultimately, the race was announced to be cancelled on April 23rd, and a spot on the calendar was eventually given to Marrakesh. However, this wasn't the end of it, as fans who had purchased tickets for the event were reporting that the promoters had essentially gone silent and they were unable to get their money back. All in all, it was a bleak affair for all parties involved. Jakarta Corruption The Jakarta e Prix was first scheduled to be on the Season 6 calendar before the COVID-19 pandemic cancelled every race outside of Berlin. Jakarta's mayor, Anise Bazwiden, bro, I swear, there are so many hard to pronounce things in this list, faced backlash after his involvement with the project and was later scrutinized by the Corruption Eradication Commission, or KPK. When a race is planned out, the city must pay Formula E a commitment fee. So in August of 2019, Mayor Bazwiden ordered the city of Jakarta's youth and sports agency to pay 180 billion Indonesian rupiah or $12 million in the United States currency via a loan from the DKI Bank to Formula E. According to some reports, Mayor Basweden approved and sent the money before it was sanctioned in the city's regional budget. Basweden was also scrutinized for a signing of a three-year deal along the Jakarta e to take place from 2022 to 2024, which may have gone against regulations prohibiting officials from agreeing to projects whose terms go outside of their time in office as Mayor Basweden will leave office in October of 2022. In addition, there were public protests about the millions of dollars spent on the Formula E event being significantly more than the amount of money invested in by the government in flood mitigation, specifically after a flash flood in 2020 that displaced 60,000 people and killed 60 people. I had to do a lot of digging through some Indonesian news sources for this, so I can't really give you a clear update on what happened with the hearing, because politics, I guess, I don't know. But what I can tell you is that the 2023 edition of the Jakarta e Prix is still on, despite Best Sweden being out of office. Burn e Prix. This will more than likely be the subject of a future video, but everything about the Season 5 Burn e Prix was... interesting to say the least. For starters, the race had to be quickly moved from Zurich, the previous site of the Swiss e Prix, due to other events occurring in the city. The circuit would be the second longest in Formula E, and one of the most challenging layouts due to the elevation changes and tight corners. A few days before the race, the track was the site of an environmental protest, as thousands took to the track on cycles, arguing against the environmental impact of the truck setting up the track, as well as of the spectators who would watch the race. Some protesters even took to vandalizing the track, ripping out sponsorship signage and cutting TV cables. The Friday shakedown of the track was done behind the safety car and at a reduced power level, as fences and barriers in parts of the track had not been set up yet. The track's paddock was located in the nearby trade show hall of the Burn Expo, and before and after each session, the cars had to be transported 800 meters via a street from the pit lane. Once the race started, of course, we all remember the infamous pileup in the first chicane, forcing the field to return to the pit lane. There was more controversy when the stewards announced that the running order would be reset to the starting order, making it so that cars damaged in the crash would start in front of cars that made it through. In the end, John Eric Verne took the win over Mitch Evans, as we'd see a relatively entertaining fight despite the narrowness of the track. The drama continued even months after the race, though, as Swiss e Prix operations, the race organizer for the event, went bankrupt. All in all, it was a messy race for Formula E, and it didn't return to the calendar in Season 6. But I gotta say, the scenery and backdrop to the circuit was absolutely beautiful, racing from the city, through the villages, and past the hillside. Really picturesque circuit, if nothing else. Montreal e Prix. Now if you haven't gotten the memo, Formula E for some reason isn't very welcome in Canada, 
but the Montreal e Prix was the one instance where a race actually went through. The circuit was initially planned to be the penultimate race of the Season 3 calendar, but was later moved to become the championship deciding doubleheader for the 2016-17 season. The city had agreed to a three-year deal with Formula E, and road improvement projects were put in place, spending about $4.5 million on the streets for the race. Hydro-Quebec would serve as the primary sponsor for the race, and the doubleheader took place on July 28th and July 29th of 2017, ending out Season 3. Following the race, controversy already began to bubble up, but this would only escalate as Formula E prepared to return the next year. Near the end of 2017, Montreal elected Mayor Valerie Plante, who had campaigned on the promise to cancel the race, citing the millions of dollars taxpayers would have to offer up to renew the event. But what we know is whatever the cost is at this point, if we, we say that 30 million, from 30 to 35 million this year, and there's gonna be probably similarly, probably 20 million the year after, if you add up the numbers, even though there's, uh, there's costs associated with the uh, canceling the contract, I do believe it's worth it. Because at this point, it, it doesn't pay off. It doesn't pay off. And it's a lot of money, and it just keeps on increasing. And I don't think this is the responsible thing to do. Mayor Plante offered up three options in regards to the race. To move the race to nearby circuit Gilles Villeneuve, to create a new track elsewhere, or to wait a year and reevaluate options then. Circuit Gilles Villeneuve was considered for the event to begin with, but was deemed too long and the idea was rejected by the race organizers. In the end, Formula E sued the city of Montreal for $16 million for the cancelled races. In the end, the settlement was made to only pay $3 million to Formula E. All in all, another example of city governments not getting along with Formula E at all. Saudi 2021 Airstrike After the second of the Duria e Prix in 2021, post-race ceremonies were cut short after a ballistic missile was launched by Yemen's ha ha Oh my god, dude. Houthi Rebel Group? A ballistic missile was launched by Yemen's Houthi Rebel Group and was intercepted by a Saudi-led military coalition over the nation's capital city Riyadh near the circuit. It is not however believed that the race was the target of the missile despite the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman being in attendance for the race. No injuries were reported, and the attack really didn't affect the event at all besides cancelling some post-race ceremonies and delaying some flights. Daniel Apt Cheating Scandal During the 2020 COVID pandemic, Formula E set up the aforementioned Race at Home Challenge, which would allow the teams of drivers of Formula E to compete virtually in an R Factor 2 Sim Series. During the May 23rd Berlin round of the series, Audi driver Daniel Lapp decided to tap esports ringer Lorenz Horzing to race for him. During the race, Apt gained suspicion from other drivers like Stoffel Van Dorn, as in the previous race at home events, he hadn't even finished in the points, and all of a sudden, he was competed for a podium finish. Good effort, Daniel Apt. <laughs> With eight tenths, Jack. Nearly nine tenths. That's impressive. But Daniel has admitted to being lost at times with his sim racing business. He's obviously... Yeah, I mean, um, I had a, I had an okay start and then um, Daniel came up the inside. To be honest, I'm, I'm questioning uh, if it was really Daniel uh, Daniel in the car, but uh, yeah, anyway. Jean-Eric Verne even went as far to state, please ask Daniel Lapp to put his zoom next time he's driving, because like Stoffel said, I'm pretty sure he wasn't in. During the race, Apt's live webcam showed his face obscured by his microphone, and on further inspection by Formula E, his IP address for the race did not match the previous races. When the news broke that Apt had cheated, and used the sim racing ringer for the event, Apt was fined £10,000, which is donated to charity, and stripped of his finish in the Berlin race. Apt claimed that it was all meant to be a joke, that it would be announced afterwards that using a ringer was part of the plan. However, it was soon announced that he had been suspended by Audi, and later he was dropped from the Audi team entirely after six seasons with the team. Renny Rast replaced Apt for the Berlin races to end out the season, while Apt ended out the season at Nia, replacing Ma King Wa, who was unable to race due to travel restrictions. Apt has not raced in Formula E since then. Battersea Park Struggles During the initial calendar creation for the first season of Formula E, many locations for a circuit within the UK were looked at, including the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, the Hyde Park, and the Wembley Stadium. Eventually, the Battersea Park in London was chosen as a championship deciding race for the first two seasons. The circuit was designed by Simon Gibbons and utilized the park's paths and foliage to create a nature-surrounded track layout. The track was met by opposition in the form of the Battersea Park Action Group, a group of Battersea residents that claimed that the race limited public access to the park, forcing a judicial review. In the end, the race went forward with Formula E opting to limit the amount of time the park was being used and hoping to restore the park as quickly as possible. Another big challenge, however, was with the park's zoo, with organizers concerned that the noise of the cars could potentially disturb the monkeys. 
So Formula E devised a plan, setting up recordings of the Miami EP a few months earlier, and playing these recordings to the monkeys at the zoo during playtime or eating time to prepare them for the event, allowing them to develop a Pavlovian response, associating the sounds of Formula E cars to happy thoughts. The plan mostly worked, but the only time the monkeys really had any issue was when a TV helicopter flew over the track. The track itself proved challenging for the drivers, with the bumpy surface in particular being a primary issue, contributing to a broken suspension on Jerome D'Ambrosio's car. Some bumps were smoothed out, while the entirety of Turn 1 was redesigned to avoid some bumps. After the first race in 2015, the series looked to return in 2016, but opposition to the race grew. The Battersea Park Action Group claimed that the race violated the Greater London Parts and Open Spaces Order of 1967, which banned events that occupy more than one-tenth of open space. In the end, Alejandro Agog worked out a deal with the group. The 2016 edition of the race would be the last time Formula E would race in Battersea Park, and following it, the park would be restored to its pre-2015 state. Apparently, this deal was disliked by the Wandsworth Council, as Formula E was actually paying quite a lot of money to race in Battersea Park. Nevertheless, the 2016 race was the last Formula E race in London, until the Excel circuit was introduced in 2021. Frank Montaigne Cocaine Andretti Autosport hired French F1 driver and Le Mans driver Frank Bentani to race with them in the first season of Formula E. After an impressive P2 finish in the first race in Beijing, he finished 15th the following race in Putrajaya. However, he informed the team that he would be unable to participate in the next race at Punta del Este just a few days before the actual event. After the race in Putrajaya, Montaigne was flagged over by the drug tester. He had tested positive for... Oh my god, dude. Benzoylecogene. Benzoylecogene? I... Let's go with that. The primary metabolite for cocaine. Instead of claiming the test was wrong, or that it had been a misunderstanding, Matini owned up to it, claiming that he had made a mistake and was guilty. He was dropped by Andretti, stripped of his result in Putrajaya, and given a two-year suspension by the FIA. A key implication of this event was who was tasked to replace him. On very short notice, Andretti tapped Jean-Eric Verne, fresh off of losing his F1 seat in Toro Rosso and considering entering IndyCar to replace Montani in the Punta del Este race. Verne rocketed to pole position and despite retiring, had a very impressive debut race that would earn him a ride with DS Virgin next season and cement his place in the sport. Amazing that Frank Montani's decision to do cocaine resulted in the arrival of Formula E's only double champion and one of the most successful drivers in its history. Truly GP Powertrain Struggles after taking over for Trace and Racing, Yarner Trolley's Trolley GP team finished last in the Season 1 Constructor standings. For Season 2, T Formula E allowed teams and manufacturers to develop their own powertrains. Trulli partnered with Italian engineering company Motomatica to develop the Motomatica JT01 powertrain. After claiming to show impressive numbers and dyno tests away from the car, the Trulli GP team arrived to the 2015 Donington Park test, installing the powertrain into the car for the first time. The powertrains proved to be incredibly unreliable and finicky, forcing the teams to remain grounded for five of the six testing days. According to the drivers, problems were rising all over the car, sometimes with the battery, sometimes with the motor, and in the end the car couldn't complete a single time to lap around the circuit. In one instance described by driver Vidantonio Luizzi, Luizzi applied the throttle in the pits and felt a sort of itching feeling in his leg. What was actually happening was that pure electricity was flowing through Luizzi's body. Thankfully, as he was part of a static car, nothing occurred when he got out, but it was a close call. Another team having powertrain issues at the time was Andretti, and ultimately, the American team decided to scrap their powertrain, opting to use the universal powertrain used in Season 1. Truly GP, on the other hand, remained confident that their Motomatica powertrain would be ready for the season, opting to use private transport in Beijing to allow for more time to work on the issues. This only created more issues, however, when the powertrain and inverters became stuck at customs, missing Formula E's scrutineering assessment. Because of this, the team was forced to withdraw from the first race of the season in Beijing. By the next race in Putrajaya, however, they were ready, and presented the components for scrutineering and safety checks. They failed. This forced the team to withdraw once again. Soon afterward, Truly GP pulled out a Formula E altogether, not attempting any of the remaining races in Season 2. For Season 3, the team was replaced by the new Panasonic Jaguar team. Formula E was on the brink of bankruptcy during Season 1. Formula E's first season was characterized by instability. Before the season began, the series had enough money to make it through its first three races in Beijing, Putrajaya, and Punta del Este. After these races, however, Formula E was in trouble. According to Alejandro Agag at one point, the series owed $25 million to its suppliers, with only about $100,000 in the bank. It became so desperate, Agag himself had to pay for the air freight of the cars to go to the Miami E-Prix out of his own pocket. 
Fortunately, Formula E was able to work out a deal with Liberty Global, sister company to Liberty Media and Discovery Communications, to become significant shareholders in the series. Because of this investment, the series is able to recover financially and is still alive nine seasons later. It was a significant risk that paid off. And so that was the Formula E iceberg. Uh, a lot of this information I had no idea about before I started researching and creating the list for the video. Uh, there were a lot of items that were suggested to me and that I thought of myself that I originally had on this list, but I was unable to find information on them, or I just didn't feel that they fit on the list. So uh, let me know what you thought down in the comment section below. Were there things on this list that you didn't know about? Things that you did know about? Things that uh, you thought I could expand on a little bit more? Uh, maybe you can tell a story of your own. Just leave all that in the comment section down below. Thank you for watching as this was a very big project and I will see you in the next video.